a mega clean hydrogen hub was is already in construction. So uh, I think while we're figuring out, you know, what are the challenges and how we can essentially go about those challenges in this new environment, uh, we would like to learn how they went about the challenges in the previous environment and how they approach collaboration. So maybe Craig. Um, by the way, I will also. Uh, I know we are short on time, but I will mention a few introduction points. <laughs> I'm Eleanor Kormatz, I head the Digital Transition uh, Consulting for SAP in the Americas, and I am joined by Jigat Shah, the Director for the Loan Program at the DOE, Michael Ducker, who is SVP for Hydrogen for Mitsubishi, and uh, Craig Busta, who is CEO of Magnum Development and President of CEO ACES De Delta Hub. So, let's get to uh, the business of understanding that project. Craig, going back to the question, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the origin story of the advanced clean energy storage hydrogen hub, the ACES Delta hub? Absolutely. The story really began back when there was an oil and gas play in southwest Wyoming, and they were looking for the western extent of the overthrust belt, and they were doing magnetic surveys, and they found this uh, anomaly in Miller County, Utah, and they brought in some seismic rigs, eventually punched a hole down to 2,900 feet below the surface of the earth. They found a mile thick sequence of salt. And that began the story. Unfortunately, they didn't find any hydrocarbons. And so the, the drill rig was put away, going east, looking for the western extent of the overthrust belt. And everybody in town was heartbroken because it was no oil and gas. And the, and the stories in, this, in the uh, restaurants at the time were of this sticky salt that they found out in this middle of nowhere basically at the time. And so here we are, fast forward today, and now you have a coal powered power plant uh, located right next to where that drill rig was, was originally put in. But the really good news about the hub is that you have access to the Union Pacific Main Line, you're interconnected with the WEC, so you have great electric connectivity. There's a refined products pipeline that runs from the refineries in Salt Lake down to Las Vegas. And you also have Kern River pipelines that come out of Wyoming with natural gas 40 miles away. So when you want to store commodities, you're in the right location, and we're happy to be a part of hydrogen production and storage. Great, and Mike, the story is about a story of collaboration, right? So how did that come about? Like, what was the problem? Yeah, sure, and, and so when you actually look at how the project started, so, you know, Craig kind of gave the history of the site, uh, this just really, I mean, when you go out to Delta, Utah, again, you're like two hours outside of Salt Lake City, middle of nowhere, and it just happened to be right across the street, right across the street from this coal fire power plant is the only domo salt in the entire Western United States. And so IPP, the Intermountain Power Agency, I should say, they committed, because of EPA regulations, they had to shut down the coal fire power plant, that they would be repowering that with a uh, hydrogen-capable combined cycle. They committed in 2025 to operate on a blend of 30% green hydrogen and 70% natural gas. Now, Mitsubishi won the gas turbine order for that for our hydrogen capable gas turbines. But back in 2019, Mitsubishi was looking at this and saying, where's the hydrogen gonna come from? You know, they, we've got a partner here, a customer who wants to have a hydrogen capable gas turbine, but how are they gonna actually run on hydrogen? So rather than sitting back and waiting for the market to uh, find the solution, we decided to invest. And so we worked with Magnum Development, who would characterize the site. We put a lot of money into developing that site. Again, 2019, we weren't talking about hydrogen hubs. We were viewed as uh, throwing our money away, doing a science project. Uh, and after tens of millions of dollars over the course of multiple years, we developed the project here with uh, Magnum Development to be the green hydrogen production and storage that was ultimately necessary for IPA to achieve their goals. And so when you go back in history, that really brings together that piece and, and ultimately the first collaboration really with uh, Craig and the Magnum development team, but a lot of that really drive into, of course, IPA and some of the other partners there too. So Jake, um, like collaboration is not necessarily ingrained in uh, you know the industry. So how do you go about facilitating that collaboration and incentivizing? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, look, I think when you hear about the stories uh, uh, of this project, but also other projects, 
Um, I think part of what it tells you is that these projects are three to five years in the making before they come to the loan program focus, right? I mean, our average loan size uh, being requested, we have a 30, 135 active applications right now in the loan programs office seeking $125 billion of loan proceeds from us, right? And then if you assume that we're providing 50% debt, and that's $250 billion worth of projects, right? So a lot of these folks have been working on these projects with an average you know, loan draw of like $900 million for three to six years before they get to the loan program's office, right? And, and I think when you think about what a good project looks like, it always looks the same, but it's, you know, it's uh, colored in the rainbow of stories, right? Fundamentally, you need a technology that really smart people believe will work. Right, in this case, that you can actually successfully store hydrogen in a salt cavern. And then separately, that you can successfully burn hydrogen in a CCGT plant, right? And, you know, it, it's easy to say, but like very difficult to prove, right? And the good thing is we have 10,000 engineers, scientists, and experts on the DOE platform. So we can generally process anything that people throw at us. So, so that was there here. I think the second piece is where's the feedstock going to come from, right? In some places, the feedstock is free, like solar panels or wind power. But like in this case, you got to actually have access to electricity, which you're going to use into electrolyzers to uh, to then produce the hydrogen to put in there, right? What's the cost of that electricity going to be? How does that work, etc. And I think they had a very innovative approach um, with Intermountain, you know, power agency. Um, then you have the offtake agreement. Who's gonna buy the power, right? Is it gonna uh, work at the, you know, then wholesale power rates? In this case, you know, uh, you've got a utility company who doesn't like blackouts and believes very strongly in having backup power and, you know, access to lots of electricity. And so they agreed to buy the power at a price that made the project work. And then the last piece, which I think people overlook regularly, is do you have a competent operator? Do you have somebody who actually can run this thing? Not just construct it, although construction itself is very difficult, and we have a great partner here managing that construction, but, um, but also, can you operate it, right? Can you make hydrogen when electricity is affordable to make? Can you, you know, turn on this ECGT when it needs to be turned on? Can you attract other people to the hub, right? When you're, when you're sitting there with 150 gigawatt hours of hydrogen in each salt cavern, I think, um, Right, and just to be, put that in perspective, the total amount of utility scale lithium ion battery storage that we expect on the grid by 2030 will be 100 gigawatt hours. Right, so each one of these salt caverns will store 150 gigawatt hours, right? And so when you have that much hydrogen, you can imagine somebody might come knocking saying, I have a green chemicals facility, I'd like to co-locate it here and use your hydrogen and pay you a premium for it or whatever it is. So. I mean, part of what they're doing here is solving this, if you build it, they will come problem. They're going first. And then, you know, over time, as a lot of these other companies that we're working with who need hydrogen as a feedstock come knocking, well, we can introduce them to our friends at Delta Aces. And so part of what the loan programs office is good at is um, we have been able to attract the nation's best innovators and entrepreneurs to trust us um, with their story. Right? And so once you have hundreds and hundreds of stories, I mean, I think we've talked to 3,000 companies in the last two years, um, you can start to see patterns and you can start to see people who should actually be talking with one another. And you know, we can help facilitate some of those conversations. Okay, well, let, let's go back for a second to implementation. Uh, because one of, the, one of the big thing about that project was the local uh, community involvement. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I would expand it Eleanor, just a little bit and talk about uh, public-private partnerships, of which we have a number of them, not only with the federal folks, with the FERC 7C that we have for natural gas storage, but the DOE loan, and, and a variety of other interfaces at the federal level. But at the state level, uh, a lot of the, the land portion and the mineral portion of our salt position is controlled by the state institutional trust lands. And that's a subdivision of the state of Utah that gets a royalty when we create revenue that goes to the benefit of the school children, which is a really, really nice
nice relationship to have. As Jigger mentioned, our offtake uh, customer is the city of Los Angeles, the largest municipal power entity in the United States. Uh, they also are affiliated with the Intermountain Power Agency that is made up with a bunch of small little municipals as well as some rural electrics. So we're the poster child for public-private uh, relationships, no doubt about it. And we're extremely proud, even at the local level, we've spent a lot of time making sure we've dotted our I's and crossed our T's from a development perspective, making sure the local community is benefiting as well. Okay, great. Well, let's go back uh, to the selection of this project. What really stood up, uh, stood out out of this project and what made you select it? Yeah, I mean, the loan programs office really is a, a, a commercial bank, right, with a public policy mandate. And so, um, you know, the, the strict answer to your question is they applied. <laughs> and so people who apply and apply properly, like get adjudicated in the order that they're received, right? So we didn't select them over 10 other people. They selected themselves by being highly competent at working with us and getting through the loan programs office. So I think that's the answer number one. But the other answer I would say that Craig alluded to, and you know, is that what we're finding is Part of the loan program's office's responsibility is to make sure we're gonna get paid back, right? What we call the reasonable prospect of repayment. And part of that is, yes, the project particulars and the spreadsheet models, et cetera, but also that people actually are thinking about what it looks like to have a good relationship with the community, what it looks like to actually have a trained workforce that can you know, operate safely, do a good job, et cetera. And I think that you know, these guys in particular thought about that from day one. So it's great. For some of our other applicants, um, they're just so worried about their technology working for first-of-a-kind deployment that we have to remind them these are important. And I don't think people are pushing back on us as much as they're saying, we haven't gotten to it yet, but we're absolutely committed to making sure we have a partnership with the local community, making sure we have good quality trained workers, et cetera. And so I think the Loan Programs Office cares deeply about making sure that these projects are set up to be successful for the entirety of the loan and not just the underwriting process in the beginning. And I'll throw on just two add-ons there too. So first of all, I think you know what we saw, at least in our experience, working with the Loan Program Office and, and Jigger, and the team they brought forward, as I said, these are commercial bankers. I mean, it's a, it's a policy mandate, but we were dealing in the negotiations with folks that understand how to get a project financed, what it takes, understanding too, in this space, think about for a uh, green hydrogen production and storage uh, contract. There is no contract we can pull down from the shelf that says, here's the terms and conditions, here's standard liquidated damages, here's warranties and reliability. None of that existed. So as we're talking about performance testing, even again, gas turbines, we can go and go to PTC 22 and talk about what is the performance spec and standards to run a, uh, a test for a gas turbine. None of that exists when we're talking about the application we had. So it requires that innovative spirit though too of looking at how do we do the underwriting for a project like this, recognizing we haven't done a project like this, but again, it's still a, you know, it's a commercially mature, it's not a science project, it's, uh, you know, uh, proven technologies, it just hasn't been done in the way we're talking about before. And so that was a huge part of working with DUE through that whole process to get it to the finish line of where we're at today. And I would quickly add to that, if I may, that from a finance perspective, it's all about managing risk, right? And so how do you address risk, not only from a technology standpoint, but also developing a salt body, most people are like, are you crazy? You know, what are you thinking about? Fortunately, we had built five caverns already and had operated them successfully, built them on time and on budget. And so we were able to minimize the risk of the salt portion of it, which is the one that gets most people kind of leaning back saying, you gotta be joking. And then the technology, our friends at Mitsubishi were able to address that. So. And I wanna go back afterwards because I know you have a hard stop at 6.30, unfortunately. So I want to do a little bit of a deviation and ask you, all three of us, like of you, uh, really, what are the key lessons learned that, that you got from you know from from that whole collaboration, and, and that you could pass on to the public? Yeah, look, I think um, when you think about the the projects that we have right now, we have about a 135 projects that have um, put in an active application. I'd say that today about, if I were to guess, about 35 of those applications are at the level of uh, professionalism and detail and capability 
that this team was to be able to get through the office, right? And that's not to say anything negative about the other 100 applicants who are not at this level, but I do think that the quality of project development and what it looks like to put together a project that hits all four of those variables I discussed, right? Technology evaluation, feedstock, offtake, and then operations. It sounds like a fairly straightforward formula, but the practice of putting it together is quite difficult, right? And so I think part of this is figuring out, we're not allowed to lower our standards to accelerate the energy transition, right? So our goal is to invest into teams to help get them up to the standards necessary to do development at you know this right level. And I do think that the ecosystem of support partners um, is weak, right? And so you have really strong uh, teams like the one here. But you know, if you want to buy access to that team, right? It's not easy to get where you can just hire this group and they'll actually just make sure the contracts are great or they'll make sure this happens or whatever it is. I mean, we're there from a maturity standpoint on solar and wind, and battery manufacturing even, or uh, you know, EV manufacturing. But we're not there for hydrogen or carbon sequestration and storage or you know even transmission line development or uh, you know uh, geothermal or some of these other sectors, right? And so, um, so one of the challenges I think we have with this public-private partnership is figuring out how we can find the space to have these conversations in a way that leads to more projects more quickly, um, but hitting that absolute standard. And what is the, sorry, just going back to your four standard, what standard is the most overlooked? What, what technologies are most development? So out of the four, four components you mentioned. I'd say that in general, finding the four pieces is actually fairly straightforward. So all 135 applications that we've received have um, checked the box on all four of those pieces, but the level of quality on all four of them is mixed. And then, you know, and their level of ability to describe um, what they would do when things go wrong is mixed, right? Because these projects never go smoothly. I mean, I'm still working on the Vogel nuclear plant, which I think went critical today. So I'm like super excited. Um, but, you know, like these projects never go smoothly. So when they don't go smoothly, you know, what do they have in place? What are the plans in place? How do they work through it? How do they do all these things? I mean, that's essential for me to get repaid, to get paid back, right? So, you know, I think what we learned through the whole process, and it's now fundamental in everything we do and all of our hydrogen hubs going forward, it's three things. It's transparency, trust, and collaboration. And it's in that order. And what we learned in the process here with IPA, our ultimate off-taker, how do they get comfortable having an off-take agreement Again, where they don't have on their shelf, they can pull back and say, here's, here's the benchmark. They had none of that. How does DOE get comfortable giving their first loan from the Renewable Program Office in over a decade? It takes transparency, so being vulnerable, showing here's work we've identified, here's down to costs, here's the technology, here's the risks. You don't sell a big rosy picture, you show them here are the risks, but here's how we're mitigating it. In that transparency, you build trust. And now with that trust, you can collaborate. And collaborating, that was absolutely was required with DUE, with IPA, to get a project like this to the finish line. And the fact is, all the projects we're working on, other hubs across the entire US and even across the Americas, that is fundamental in everything we do at Mitsubishi, is building that transparency, that trust and collaboration. I couldn't agree more, Mike. And I, I would just add, and, and just put a bow on the top of it, relationships matter. In today's world, people don't think think that way anymore, it's brute force or whatever the, the approach happens to be. But, but in our world, we have found locally, at the state and at the federal level, those relationships matter and you develop those relationships by being trustworthy and transparent. And because and, and, you're right, things don't always go well and there will be problems and you need to rely on those relationships to work through. You can go ahead at any time, we'll continue the conversation. Thank you, everybody. This is this. We were so excited about this project, um, and the collaboration was extraordinary. And so, just really excited about uh, being a part of this. Thank you. Thank you.